hopefully uh, warm you up a little bit with uh, stimulating uh, discussion through the speeches and the panels and so on. I'm going to talk, you know, very briefly about uh, some work I've been doing with the UN World Tourism Organization dealing with multi-country destination development, particular concern with how we can bring more long-haul travelers from places like China and India, Malaysia, to the Americas. So that's the whole context in which uh, the research was done. Um, for those of you who are interested in the more detailed report, I have here the presentation, both in English, it's kind of a slide presentation, and then the full report in, in Spanish. Uh, if you would like to you know, access that, I'm just going to talk about a few of the highlights here. Multi-country destination is simply a, a, a trip that includes visitations to destinations shared by two or more countries. And they, they generally offer a joint tourism product, a route requiring air, land, water connectivity, and a lot of facilitation like visas. Uh, why is a multi-country destination of interest? Let's take it like from the traveler's perspective. Now, if you go into the report, I have a lot of detail on each of these motivations. But in a simple way, people like to collect places. I know I do. When I was a very active skier, I tried to ski as many slopes as possible. I'm still doing scuba diving, and I still like to try scuba diving in many different places. And often you can combine countries in those types of collection of places. Uh, numerosity, I mean, it's kind of simple. I guess people think, well, the more places I visit, maybe the higher value, at least in the consumer's mind. And variety, novelty, seeking, uh, the, the quest, if you will, for diversified experiences. The economic motive, if you're traveling to several countries, maybe you're going to get more value for the money paid. And also the lower perceived risk reducing the uncertainty and, and risk, essentially with multi-countries, maybe at least one or two of the, uh, the destinations will work for you. Now, taking it from the uh, destination perspective, why do destinations want to consider working together to offer multi-country uh, types of itineraries? Cumulative attraction. So here we have the ability with many countries to put together different types of, of activities and experiences. For example, I'm working now in Bhutan, which is a landlocked country. It's obvious that the, the, one of the key access points through Bangkok gives you Thailand. So there you have this combination of mountains, land, uh, uh, you know, locked type of a destination with you know, the beaches and the coastal attractions of uh, Thailand. Uh, complementarity, you know, different destinations can combine their resources. Uh, I'm going to talk about a number of root concepts later, so I won't go into that in any more detail, but I really think the answer to how we could get countries to work together is in developing routes and itineraries uh, that attract people for the long haul uh, type travel. Mm -hmm. Special interest appeal. Uh, it appears that birders will travel just about anywhere in the world to add, you know, to their list. Uh, joint marketing, regional marketing, collaboration, cooperation. One of the good examples that I've worked with is the um, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. They've been able to come up with different types of services uh, in the coastal areas that attract yachts. So they, this would be water supply, uh, different types of, of outfitting, different kinds of um, uh, maintenance and, and repair units so that they can cater to that very upscale yacht market. OK, some of the tour route examples, which I think is probably the best way of getting countries to work together, uh, follow. We have the Andean uh, road system, as you can see here. This covers the entire route of the, uh, the Andean from Argentina to Chile to Bolivia to Peru and all the way up to, uh, to Colombia. Now, this is 273 sites over 6,000 kilometers. 
Uh, another one, uh, La Ruta Maya. La Ruta Maya is basically Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. This was popularized by William Garrett when he was the chairman of the National Geographic magazine. Uh, the slave routes, uh, Steve Lukenbaum early talked about the slave routes, and he, he's basically looking for uh, slave wrecks, particularly coast, near the coast where the slaves left the continent uh, on their, their way to, to the Americas. But there are many possibilities in developing routes that relate to where the slaves ended up, uh, the sorry stories, the difficulties encountered, and the way in which uh, these routes if you will, connected the slave trade from Africa into South America, Central America, North America, and all the stories that can be told and the history and the culture. Uh, several years ago, uh, a fellow by the name of Lou DeMori and others, the Minister of, of Tourism of Bermuda, actually created a project called the Slave Route Diaspora, where they were able to kind of help interpret for African-Americans uh, or uh, different African descent in the Caribbean, Central America, and uh, South America, where they came from. It's easier to do now because of DNA analysis. Uh, you can actually identify where you might have come from in some part of Africa, and it kind of encourage people to travel back. Uh, forts of the Caribbean, we have many uh, forts uh, in the Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico, St. Kitts, Antigua, Haiti, the Citadel, that can be connected. Most of these are World Heritage uh, sites. The Spanish gold routes, uh, you know, the whole quest, if you will, for treasure and bringing that treasure back into Spain actually propped up the Spanish economy and some of the related European economies. But again, very, very interesting routes and stories that can be developed there. The Jesuit route. Basically, 30 locations that go back to 1609. Uh, that includes Antigua, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And it also includes seven World Heritage Sites. And there are many other concepts. We could deal with the Spanish explorers, Columbus, Cortez, Pizarro, Ponce de, de Leon, and others. OK. In terms of route development, some of the factors that we've analyzed, the constraints. One of the problems is that governments uh, and uh, development assistance agencies tend to be very national focused. It's very hard to get them to work together uh, regionally. We don't have the kind of mechanisms that we need. Another challenge in, in establishing transnational routes is to assure effective mechanisms for information sharing and international cooperation. And the planning and, and management needs to be harmonized. We have to tell the story of the entire route. You know, for example, uh, for the Andean route, most people think of the Inca Trail, you know, uh, and they don't recognize that this is a huge, you know, 1,000 mile series of sites. We have to tell the whole story. Lessons learned. This type of land and water route development requires major infrastructure development, and that takes infrastructure investment. I'd call attention to the World Bank and the investment that they've made in cultural heritage linked to sustainable tourism. Community enterprise and benefits need to be shared. It's the subsidiary concept. Local people need to be involved, planning, decision making, and they need to benefit shared. Another benchmark we've looked at is the uh, Institute for Cultural Roots in Luxembourg, and also the UNWTO Silk Route, and perhaps those can be used as well. Recommendations from the Global Travel Association Coalition. Many of you may have not heard about this, but this is the Organization of American States, linked in with the UNWTO Regional Commission, has linked into this association, which includes World Travel Tourism Council, uh, and a whole variety of international organizations. They suggest that we need to do the following kinds of things. Expand transparent visa processes, visa waiver, regional visa agreements, trusted traveler programs, seamless travel procedures. Use the new technologies to improve travel efficiency, security. Advance air, rail, seal, 
sea and road connectivity, stimulate government and private sector cooperation, and strengthen public-private partnerships. And just a little bit of additional research that I have in progress at the present time. Again, working with the UN World Tourism Organization, we're beginning to look at some of the similar measures that apply to the cruise business, particularly in the ASEAN countries, and a particular focus on the shore-based excursions and trying to use sustainability approaches and criteria to improve the quality of the experience. And sorry, I had to use some slides. <laughs> Thank you very much.